Good evening to all. I would like to welcome Dr. Anita Devadas, the early career researcher uh, for the early career researcher session from Swansea University, UK. And also, I will I, I would like to welcome Dr. Sendil Kumar, Associate Professor, Department of Chemistry, School of Advanced Science, PAT. Welcome you, sir. For now, the session is over to chairperson. So, good evening, one and all present here. Uh, First of all, I would like to uh, thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and uh, it's a special mention to Dr. Sudhagar and uh, Dr. Loganathan. And it's my pleasure to introduce uh, the speaker of this session, Dr. Anita. Okay, uh, Dr. Anita has obtained her PhD from Dublin University, Dublin City University, Ireland. After her PhD, uh, she has acquired plenty of research experiences. She has carried out her postdoctoral research at Hanyang University, South Korea and Tokyo Institute of Science, Japan. Currently, she is availing the most prestigious Marie Curie Fellowship at the College of Engineering Center for Nano Health in Swansea University, uh, UK. She has got her research expertise in biosensors, nanomaterials, analytical chemistry, and surface chemistry. And uh, to her credits, she has published uh, more than 42 articles in highly reputed journals and has got a uh, H index of 21. She has got uh, many other laurels to read. Since the organizer, uh, organizers have asked to keep the introduction brief, let me stop here. Okay. I request Dr. Anita to deliver her lecture on innovative bio nanobiosensors for early point of care diagnostics. Dr. Anita, please. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sandal. Uh, I'll just share my screen now. Yeah, I hope uh, everyone can see my... Uh, Yes. Uh, yeah. Can you see the screen? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hope you're all enjoying the uh, different sessions here in this event. Uh, I'm uh, glad to be a part of this one. I'm uh, Anita Devadas, a Circumri uh, Marie Curie Fellow working in College of Engineering uh, in Swansea University. So my research focuses on developing uh, innovative nanobiosensors for early point of care diagnostics. So I uh, hope you have uh, um, you know, attended uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Professor Gareth Jenkins talk um, on uh, 1st of June. He gave a wonderful uh, introduction about Swansea University. For those who missed that, uh, I'm just giving a brief introduction. So um, we belong to Swansea University, which is located in Wales uh, in the Southwest uh, part of um, uh, in, uh, UK. And uh, we have two different campuses, Singleton Campus, where I am, uh, you know, our research center is um, uh, hosted. And uh, we have recently de developed a, a new campus for, um, we call them Bay Campus, which hosts College of Engineering as well as a uh, School of Management in there. So uh, my research group is a part of um, uh, the research center called Center for Nano Health. In Center for Nano Health, we, um, we are doing different research themes, um, including uh, biosensors, tissue engineering, nanotoxicology, rheology, and uh, device fabrication, microfluidics, and on. Uh, my research group belongs to the Sensors Research Division uh, in Center for Nano Health. So I would like to give a brief introduction uh, about uh, biosensors and the current recent trends in biosensor technologies, and then what are all the current challenges. So we can just discuss on that one uh, you know, through the session. So biosensors are the devices that utilizes biological or molecular recognizers like enzymes and antibodies to indicate the amount of a target and a light. So this figure shows the basic components, which is the sensing element and the transducer, which is connected to the reader. So here the sensing element can be an enzyme or antibody or a DNA. So by attaching these uh, sensing elements uh, to the transducer, which is typically a nanomaterial, um, uh, it will generate some uh, signal generation. Uh, when, this, um, when, when this comes in contact with the analyte, there will be an increase in the signal, change in the signal, which will be measured at the reader. So here, uh, the beauty of this uh, technology is the in change in the signal is directly related to the concentration of the analyte, which we are looking for. So thus, by um, uh, you know, detecting the change in the signal, we can just uh, measure the concentration of the analyte that we are interested in. So this is the basic principle of a uh, working principle of a biosensor. And there are different types of transducer, different nanomaterials, and uh, based on the technology, the nanomaterial platform varies. The science looks fine, but uh, why do we need biosensors? 
So recently, the understanding of the disease has improved markedly and emphasizes prevention rather than remedy and better treatment through early diagnostics. When we look into the life expectancy data here, uh, the life expectancy of a person at birth in the developed country is over 85 years, whereas the life expectancy falls below 70 years for the developing countries. And when we look into the uh, underdeveloped countries or underdeveloped countries, this falls below uh, 60 years or even like, you know, around 50 years. So there is a huge gap between this life expectancy, which indicates that the uh, life expectancy of the person depends on the type of healthcare technologies that are available in the surroundings. So as a biomedical scientist, my research interest is to develop low cost um, nanobiosensor technologies so that it can be uh, you know, used worldwide uh, despite of the, um, you know, the um, um, wealth of the country. And uh, healthcare, uh, health economics has become an important part uh, uh, at this stage, and every government is very keen on that one. So by developing uh, low-cost healthcare technologies, we would be able to increase the life expectancy of the person, uh, even in the underdeveloped as well as the developing countries. On the other hand, even the developed countries are more interested on early diagnostics because uh, uh, you know, the type of, uh, um, you know, the problem is different because uh, in the developed countries, because there are there are more number of uh, aged population. They are facing loads of uh, diseases related to aging. So there is still a requirement in that aspect. So uh, this figure shows the disease progression curve here. So here, the severity, both the severity as well as the burden of any disease increases exponentially over the disease progression. At the present, uh, the current uh, uh, clinical intervention falls around here, which happens after the uh, appearance of any symptoms. However, the onset of the disease um, uh, indicated by the uh, presence of biomarkers in the body uh, starts even earlier. So here, uh, sometimes th there is a huge gap between the onset of the disease as well as the uh, appearance of symptoms. And in some cases, the symptoms are not quite uh, evident, uh, for example, in COVID. So uh, this is where uh, the, uh, you know, the effect of or the uh, usefulness of uh, this biosensor technology uh, occurs because the sensor technology will enable us to detect even uh, before the, uh, you know, the uh, occurrence of any symptoms. For example, if we just look into the uh, COVID-19 disease progression, so the person develops symptoms after five days uh, of being exposed to the virus. In this case, within that five days, he might be transmitting it to the other people. So that is the risk of infection. And um, whereas in the case of Alzheimer's, if we look into that one, currently we are uh, detecting uh, the Alzheimer's disease for, uh, you know, in the old age population at a very later stage. However, the uh, scientists are predicting the disease uh, on, you know, the onset of the disease occurs at least 10 to 15 years before, um, you know, uh, the present uh, detection stage. So uh, this is where uh, the role of biosensors are uh, really important. And then like, you know, it, uh, it increases the possibility of uh, detecting it at an early, uh, early stage, which uh, increases the, uh, which eases the uh, treatment um, uh, efficiency. So um, the world of, uh, uh, you know, the field of biosensors is vast. So there are a huge number of um, uh, aspects of, um, uh, you know, research going on in biosensors. Based on the uh, sensing element, there are, two different types of sensors, biocatalytic sensors and affinity biosensors. So biocatalytic sensors, we can call them as a, both non-enzymatic as well as enzymatic biosensors falls under the category. Whereas the affinity biosensors, uh, we have like uh, immunosensors, cytosensors and uh, genosensors comes under the affinity biosensors. And here the sensing response is based on the binding event like uh, antibody antigen binding and those kind of things. In uh, uh, biocatalytic sensor, the catalytic activity at the electrode surface gives a change in signal and which will be detected. And based on the transducer, uh, which converts the biological signal into electrical signal, uh, there are different types of sensors, including optical sensors, plasmonic sensors, uh, electrochemical sensors, and uh, calorimetric sensors, and etc. But um, uh, I'm interested in electrochemical-based sensors, uh, which has like a huge uh, amount of um, um, uh, advantage, and uh, you know the possibility for miniaturization, lower limits of detection, and the possibility for achieving high sensitivity and uh, selectivity. 
So here, uh, this figure shows a typical example of a three electrode system, which we use for constructing an electrochemical biosensor. So here, uh, the um, electrochemical biosensors uh, converts the uh, chemical stimuli into electrical signals. And here, uh, the electrodes pass the, uh, plays the integral part of an uh, electrochemical sensor. And the working electrode is the sensor platform, which can be modified uh, by biomolecules based on the uh, disease interest. And uh, the counter electrode completes the electrical uh, circuit in the system. And the reference electrode pr provides a, a standard and stable reference uh, uh, potential uh, in the system. So here, the biosensor works on the principle of electron flow from the chemical changes, particularly uh, the redox processes uh, in that system. So uh, how to evaluate the uh, biosensor performance? So uh, there are uh, different factors that we are looking for is uh, accuracy, sensitivity, selectivity, and limits of detection. Here, uh, the factor limits of detection um, uh, controls uh, how early we can detect a disease. And the accuracy is related to the false positive and the sensitivity related to the false negative uh, of the sensor performance. And selectivity will give uh, low interference and then like, you know, it is um, uh, selective for that particular uh, disease. So this figure can be, um, I mean, uh, you can just imagine the electrochemical biosensor strips like this. And then, uh, so which will have a nanomaterial platform that is the working electrode and the silver silver chloride as the reference electrode and PT counter electrode. And the biomolecules will be immobilized on this um, uh, nanomaterial platform and then uh, we'll read the signal output uh, when, it, when this um, uh, working electrode comes in contact with the, um, uh, with the analyte. And uh, the advantages of the electrochemical sensors is the high sensitivity, selectivity, low cost. It is user-friendly, very simple to use, and there is a, a possibility for large-scale manufacture. So uh, as there are uh, different types of sensors, um, each sensor has its own uh, limits and um, uh, pros and cons. So for example, in the non-enzymatic system, which utilizes only the nanomaterials and directly detect uh, the, um, you know, the analyte of interest by uh, the chemical reaction, uh, the, it gives very high sensitivity and lower limits of detection. However, multi-analyte detection becomes a, a, a you know, possible challenge uh, in this case. Whereas uh, in, the, uh, in the case of uh, enzyme-based biosensors or affinity sensors like immunosensors, genosensors, uh, there are, there, it has high specificity and sensitivity, although the enzyme active, maintaining the enzyme activity, um, you know, even after the production or stability of the sensors and uh, avoiding the electrode fouling uh, becomes a, a huge challenge in these cases. So those areas needs to be more, um, uh, you know, more attention uh, for future research. So uh, in order to uh, address these challenges, it is important to um, understand the nanobio interfaces where my research uh, comes in place. And over the past eight years, I have been working on this area. So I have been uh, developing technologies to understand the mechanistic pathways between the biomolecules and the electrode itself. And uh, we, are, we were just investigating the electron transfer between the biomolecules. And from our research, we have just um, uh, understood that uh, the mode of attachment of these biomolecules plays a critical role uh, in controlling the electron transfer between the biomolecules and the nanomaterials. So we have uh, established different types of uh, surface functionalization uh, platforms, including uh, uh, polymerization and uh, ligand, uh, you know, ligand immobilizing the antibodies or um, biomolecules using the ligands and using uh, gold nanoparticles as a, a platform for immobilizing these, um, uh, nanomaterial, these uh, biomolecules. And on the other side, uh, the, uh, the nature of the, uh, the sensing platform plays a critical role uh, in defining the sensitivity uh, of uh, the biosensor. So we have developed different types of uh, biosensor and uh, demonstrated proof of concept sensing using a wide range of nanomaterials ranging from zero dimensional gold nanoparticles, one-dimensional TiO2 nanowires, and two-dimensional graphene, and so on. So uh, I would like to give a few just of, um, um, uh, you know, sensors that, that have been developed in our group. So uh, this one uh, is an example for a non-enzymatic electrochemical sensor. Here we have used uh, carbon nitride nanotubes and decorated the uh, cobalt PT nanoparticles uh, for uh, NADH uh, detection. Here we have just chosen uh, cobalt PT nanoparticles because of its high catalytic activity. 
And um, uh, so our sense, we have just demonstrated um, uh, excellent stability of these electrodes and uh, demonstrated um, good, uh, um, you know, highly sensitive detection of NADH uh, through electrochemical uh, biosensing. And in other work, uh, we have uh, we were interested in developing one-dimensional nanowires. So we have chosen uh, nafion nanofibers. So through electrospinning process, we have developed uh, nafion nanofibers and gold nanoparticle embedded nafion nanofibers. And here we have uh, immobilized horseradish peroxidase (HRP), uh, commonly known as HRP, uh, on these uh, gold nanoparticles. And we have just utilized that as a platform for uh, detecting hydrogen peroxide sensing. And our sensors showed um, a limit of detection of uh, 38 nanomolar and, uh, and a wide uh, range of um, uh, linear detection. So, and then uh, th these electrodes showed very high sensitivity um, and very high stability at four degrees Celsius. And we have published this in an analyst. And um, um, we, we just moved on to uh, developing an electrochemical immunosensor uh, on an EPSRC project. Uh, which was about to develop uh, uh, biosensors for uh, detecting Alzheimer biomarkers. So uh, Alzheimer's, uh, as we know, it is a neurodegenerative disease uh, which occurs in the older uh, population. And uh, Alzheimer, Alzheimer's disease is the most common uh, cause of dementia. However, the main challenge for this one is um, uh, there is no single biomarker for uh, identifying this, this disease. So we need to develop multi uh, analyte detection. Um, um, and then like, you know, so we are just developing that, we are in that process of developing that um, multi analyte detection. And here we have just established uh, electropolymerization process in order to improve the amine surface terminologies on the uh, graphene surface. Uh, for uh, effective immobilization of the antibodies. So uh, this is an immunosensor. So we attach the antibodies and then we perform the sensor for detecting amyloid beta protein, which is uh, corresponding to the, um, uh, you know, the formation of amyloid beta plague, which results in uh, Alzheimer's disease in older population. So we have uh, established very uh, good sensitivity and uh, we have just analyzed different factors uh, influencing this, uh, uh, you know, the sensor performance, as well as um, uh, this, uh, our sensor shows very high specificity, specificity towards, um, uh, you know, towards this um, uh, amyloid beta protein. And here, uh, uh, because, I mean, one good factor about uh, using these antibodies is like, you know, the specificity is very high because it is very selective to that protein. So, um, you know, which can be seen in this graph. And um, um, recently we have just moved towards uh, developing, uh, uh, you know, biosensor field effect transistor based biosensors because of the possibilities of uh, affording, um, um, you know, large scale fabrication, because that is the, um, you know, existing challenge, uh, which we can just discuss in, uh, in the later slide. So here uh, we have the uh, graphene channels in between the source and drain and uh, the chemical functionalization on, um, uh, on this graphene channel affects the electron conductivity of the graphene channel, which can be measured. And uh, by uh, measuring the change in the resistance, we could be able to um, uh, you know, uh, do the sensing. So here, for example, uh, we have just functionalized that uh, with the DAN layer and attached the antibody and then uh, follows by the uh, specific binding with the protein. Uh, sorry. So here, if we could look into the uh, resistance change, there is a clear change at every stage of functionalization, uh, which is uh, corresponding to the, um, you know, the sensitivity of the graphene. And typically, these uh, uh, these devices, there there are four devices here. Um, uh, there is a possibility for making hundreds of devices in a single process. That is the beauty of uh, semiconductor device processing, uh, which needs a uh, uh, you know clean room um, um, clean room facility for fabrication. However, uh, because of the possibility of large scale fabrication, there is a more possibility for uh, taking this forward, uh, uh, you know, through commercialization, uh, because that is a basic requirement for uh, commercialization. And also we are working on uh, exploring the real time sensing of antibody and antigen binding, um, uh, you know, using these sensors, which is uh, under progress. So when we look into the current trends of uh, uh, COVID-19 detection, uh, I think most of you would be aware of uh, uh, this graph showing the appearance of uh, IgM um, uh, antibodies, which shows the prevalence of the disease. Uh, and um, um, the, IgG, the appearance of IgG occurs at the recovery period, which stays in the blood, um, you know, so, and, they, and provides the long-term immunity. 
So by detecting the IgG, we can uh, analyze the patient, whether they have uh, already previously had a history of uh, infection. And by detecting the IgM becomes the um, uh, possibility for uh, detecting whether the person is, uh, uh, you know, person is infected currently uh, by coronavirus. So there are uh, different types of uh, sensor kits that are available in the market, and there are loads of uh, research going on in that um, uh, in this area. For example, um, uh, this uh, the recent research on uh, published in uh, ACS Nano uh, by Kim et al. shows the um, uh, typical use of a field effect trans graphene field effect transistor. Here they have just used uh, uh, p base as the uh, functionalization uh, molecule. Uh, which is used for attaching the antibody uh, that is specific for uh, SARS coronavirus to spike antibody. So uh, that is specific for the coronavirus. So here they are just uh, uh, detecting the coronavirus from uh, both laboratory scale as well as from the uh, COVID-19 infected patients. So this, I mean, uh, this shows a very high sensitivity and uh, because of the possibility for uh, large scale um, fabrication of, um, uh, you know, these um, uh, large scale fabrication of this technology, it is, um, uh, it is possible to take it forward, uh, you know, and uh, to bring it to the market. And um, uh, there are other types of, um, uh, you know, biosensors that are uh, available uh, for COVID-19 detection. Uh, the simple one is the lateral flow technology, which, um, um, you know, which, uh, quantifies the amount of IgM and IgG antibody, um, you know, in a person. So this gives, uh, uh, this is a, uh, you know, very standard uh, type of technology technique, which mimics the uh, pregnancy tests that are available in the market. And uh, there are also like uh, other type of uh, attempts in order to, uh, you know, um, improve the sample collection. For example, Zimmer and Peacock Limited, uh, one of our collaborator, they have invented, a, uh, they have come up with a new type of uh, technique in order to, uh, you know, the, uh, instead of uh, selecting the, um, you know, the samples for um, PCR, te PCR test for COVID-19 by, uh, by the swab test in the throat, they have just come up with uh, uh, consolidating the breath and then like, you know, turning that as a sample for, uh, for the PCR test. And in this, in this case, they have just uh, uh, shown that uh, uh, the cross-contamination as well as the interference from other, um, you know, other molecule has uh, uh, decreased a lot, uh, like, you know, from this uh, uh, breath condenser. And uh, there is another uh, recent report on developing this uh, uh, plasmonic uh, sensing. So here, um, um, you know, the research group from uh, Sweden, they have um, uh, from Switzerland. So they have just uh, uh, come up with the plasmonic sensor where they have used uh, gold nano crystals, um, gold nano islands as the substrate. And they have just developed the, um, um, you know, surface plasmon resonance based sensors for the detection of uh, this COVID-19 uh, uh, disease. So here they have just, uh, they are just uh, detecting the, uh, and they are detecting the antibodies. So, so you know, the, uh, the uh, biosensors, uh, we can just focus both on detecting the antibody immune response of a person, as well as like, you know, directly detecting the, um, the virus itself. So these are all the recent updates, recent trends on the COVID-19 detection, um, uh, you know, that are available in the market that are reported. And uh, when we look into the uh, overall uh, effect of biosensors, so worldwide, there are nearly, um, uh, you know, thousands of, uh, uh, you know, publications comes around in the, um, in the electrochemical biosensors or in biosensors in general. However, in order to translate these biosensors to market, uh, there are not many uh, products available at the market, and uh, the current pandemic situation had made it uh, uh, made most of the researchers to realize uh, that they are doing wonderful research in the lab, but then translating that research to commercial product or uh, you know in in a pandemic situation, uh, the technology is not ready. So you know the main uh, problem here is the uh, translation. Uh, the gap, uh, which um, which is defined as the valley of death uh, between academia and industry, because uh, uh, academic research is wonderful in lab scale, um, um, you know, uh, and it shows very high sensitivity, uh, specificity, and um, uh, you know, excellent research in a way, uh, research excellence. However, when we transfer it to the market, uh, there is a lot um, uh, necessity for uh, developing technologies that are adaptable for industrial scale. 
uh, most of the research, um, uh, you know, most of the experimental processes that we develop in the lab scale, they are not compatible for industrial scale um, uh, development. So, you know, it needs to be, um, uh, so we need to take into account what the industry needs. So in order to, you know, overcome this valley of death, we need a very good understanding between the industrial requirement, which needs uh, academic and industry collaborations. So this can't be done in a single day. Uh, everyone can understand that one. But, uh, but the thing is like, if we have already uh, close collaboration with industries and if we start working together on multidisciplinary projects, then uh, uh, people will realize the gaps between the, um, you know, the technology transfer from, uh, uh, from academia to industry, which would help and uh, which would um, also uh, improve, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, it will fasten the, uh, you know, the technology transfer and uh, we can just see the products in the market that can be uh, used for general public. And uh, although we know there are like uh, uh, PCR techniques for, for, um, you know, for detecting all these, um, uh, you know, for even for COVID-19, we are, we have standard uh, RT-PCR test, but then the main challenge with RT-PCR test is uh, it takes a longer time for, uh, you know, to know the results as well as uh, it needs a sample um, a transportation. So the doctors need to collect the sample, transport it to the laboratory, which needs a, uh, you know, a costly equipment to analyze. And then they need to wait until they hear from the, um, hear the results from the laboratories. However, if we, if we could uh, develop a point of care sensors that can be used at home, uh, or like uh, at the point of care, like in the hospital or care homes, uh, that is gonna fasten. And uh, these electrochemical techniques are very rapid. So we can get results in, um, uh, you know, in um, within few minutes, as well as like, you know, the requirement, uh, it doesn't need like, you know, too much of the sample. So by a single uh, pinprick test, we would be able to, um, uh, we would be able to, um, you know, get the results. So that would be the futuristic and the electrochemical biosensors also moving forward uh, in the form of uh, wearable sensors and um, uh, you know uh, tattoo biosensors and stuff. So uh, those has a very good market. And currently, um, experts are predicting the um, you know biosensor market. Current my market in two thousand twenty is uh, eighteen million and eighteen billion, and then it is gonna uh, you know go to thirty three billion by two twenty twenty five. So there is a huge requirement for uh, biosensors, healthcare technologies, and um, you know, in general. So uh, you know, if we could look into those, um, uh, you know, the uh, the market uh, reality and the um, you know and the need, then we would be able to fine tune our research and uh, you know move forward and uh, offer uh, wonderful solutions, uh, you know, to the public. So. Uh, so I would like to, in summary, uh, there is a huge market need for nanobiosensors. The demand for developing uh, uh, low cost and rapid detection with high sensitivity and selectivity is still there because there are new uh, new type of, uh, uh, you know, the diseases are coming up and, uh, uh, you know, uh, human, um, human race is uh, facing loads of um, uh, healthcare issues. And so the demand is still there. And the complexity of the disease demands uh, multi analyte detection using microliter samples. So, and uh, but it is uh, highly critical uh, to uh, you know bridge uh, collaboration between uh, industry, academia, and stakeholders in order to make this uh, you know the wonderful research in the lab uh, to uh, you know to bring it into reality. Uh, that is to to be to you know to make it available in the um, you know shelves of the supermarket. For the people to you know get it similar to a, a normal uh, you know glucose biosensors that are available uh, at the minute so yeah thank you so <clears throat> thank you dr anita uh, for uh, for uh, addressing on the innovative biosensor you started from simple non enzymatic sensors and you have covered up to bio FET sensors. I think uh, you've covered you know, a wide spectrum of bio, uh, biosensors and different biosensing strategies adopted. And uh, you know, it was a very a very informative session and uh, we had uh, around 438 participants. They're still waiting. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of questions that are asked by the participants. Okay, uh, for the benefit of you know broader uh, audience. So let me pick a few questions. 
So the antibody-based biosensors for COVID-19 have shown many false negative results as the antibodies are produced after a few days of infection. So how can we overcome this issue? How this problem can be solved? So uh, at the minute, I think, uh, um, you know, there is a loads of, um, uh, you know, confusion between this uh, antibody test. Uh, but then like, um, even though we develop uh, antibody tests, we need to uh, evaluate their performance uh, against the gold standards. So, um, you know, ISO standardization and gold standardization is very important. And, uh, uh, you know, and again, uh, the uh, development of these antibody tests uh, for COVID-19 detection is uh, still at the early stage, I would say. So it needs loads of optimization. And then like, um, uh, re you know, we need to check the uh, reproducibility because uh, at this pandemic situation, maybe, uh, uh, you know, if we get, uh, for example, 50% uh, or 60% reproducibility, people might be bringing it to the market because they can't wait anymore uh, because of the uh, you know, current uh, requirement. However, by improving the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the functionalization of the antibodies and then like, you know, uh, uh, doing repeated uh, tests for that one and uh, you know, equating that with the uh, gold standardization, uh, that will give us uh, more reliable uh, results in the antibody test. It is a, a very known test, but um, uh, it just needs time maybe for the researchers to uh, evaluate and then like, you know, to um, uh, evaluate the performance and validate the um, uh, efficiency of those sensors. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, you talked about, you know, uh, converting the laboratory research into industrial uh, products. You talked about uh, a lot of things to be done in the translational research. And there is one question related to that. Uh, okay, there is a, a lot of cost involved in scaling down a macro system to a nano system. Uh -huh. uh, can you please explain how we are supposed to do it and maintain the cost of the sensor? So if you want to use nanoparticle for better performance, you know, yeah. automatically it would uh, you know, uh, increase the, the expenses of making the device, right? So yeah. how to overcome, overcome that? See, um, for example, uh, uh, when we just talk about the uh, graphene biosensors or any kind of nanomaterials, when we just look into the smaller scale, it's going to take like, you know, long uh, loads of materials, like, you know, material cost, labor cost and everything. But then if by developing like uh, industry friendly processes, for example, the current sensor uh, platforms uh, for, uh, for research purpose uh, mostly depends on the screen printing technology, which prints the, um, you know, which makes uh, graphene inks or nanomaterial as an ink and then they just, uh, fabric, you know, they fabricate large scale. So when we take it to the large scale, uh, I'm pretty sure these nanomaterials are not going to be, uh, you know, um, I mean, the major part of the cost uh, for any sensor is not from the material, it is from the labor. So labor cost is the, you know, is the, uh, uh, in a bigger picture, the labor cost is the, uh, you know, the main component of determining the cost or in increasing the cost. So in that case, if we just uh, develop uh, large scale fabrications, like uh, instead of making individual sensors, like 10 at a time, if we could uh, come up with the process that can make like thousands of, uh, uh, you know, sensors at the same same time, that's gonna reduce the labor cost, which will cut down the, uh, you know, the overall cost of the sensor system. Okay. So that would be one aspect to be, uh, you know, taken into account. So uh, one more question related to that uh, interference. Uh, yeah. The IgM and IgG uh, both can arise uh, in most type of disease like dengue, malaria, Okay, and uh, do analyzing antibodies may cause any false positive results uh, because of some interference? <coughs> uh, there could be some interference, um, uh, you know, by, uh, I mean, uh, in that system. But then uh, I think uh, while designing the uh, biosensor system, we need to be uh, keen on, uh, you know, taking into account. And then different disease uh, responds differently. And then like, you know, it's not the same kind of biomarker that we use for detecting IgM and IgG. So there might be interference, but uh, we, we should be able to uh, clearly uh, differentiate that one, uh, you know, while uh, while developing the sense. Okay. So what is the difference uh, between the biosensor and biomarker? Because this question has been raised by different many people. Okay, okay. Yeah, um, so biosensor is the device, external device that we use to detect, um, uh, you know, any disease. Biomarker is uh, generated within the body in order to fight, um, you know, that disease, that infection. 
For example, um, you know, we use a thermometer. It is a very simple example. For example, you know, thermometer is an external device that is a sensor, but then a rise in temperature in the body, uh, you know, as a response to the any kind of infection. So the temperature is a biomarker that, you know, that is a simple example. In the case of a glucose sensor, because, um, uh, you know, white population in India or a diabetic, so people can relate it easily to that one. Uh, so we have glucometers, uh, you know, different types of uh, sensors we use, uh, they are external, that will detect the change in the, uh, you know, uh, levels of glucose. Pure glucose is the biomarker. Uh, if a patient is diabetes, uh, if they are like, you know, type 2 or type 1 diabetic, uh, if they consume too much uh, sugar uh, in their, you know, in their food or like, you know, food intake, uh, that will, uh, you know, that will uh, be break down into glucose, which will, um, you know, which will, you um, mix in the blood. So that will increase the blood glucose level. So here, blood will be the biomarker and uh, the sensor that is detecting the, you know, the glucose uh, is the biosensor. So biosensor is the technology, the overall technology and biomarker is the immune response of the body, uh, which, which can be present in saliva. It can be present in, um, 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 you know, bodily fluids like uh, urine. It can be present in blood plasma. So there are different types of biomarkers for each disease, and they are very specific for that particular disease. So there is a huge, uh, huge of uh, research happening uh, around, uh, you know, uh, finding the uh, biomarkers for each disease, like uh, cancer specific biomarkers, Alzheimer's specific biomarkers, and COVID-19 specific biomarkers, which will be very selective for that particular disease. Yeah. Because many of the questions were based on your Alzheimer work only. So they've asked okay. about the multi analyte detection and there they've asked further questions on biosensors yeah. so, and biomarkers. Okay. And in the one, case of uh, Alzheimer's, there are loads of uh, uh, research happening in the field of uh, biomarkers to you know identify. For example, uh, uh, APOE is a protein that is related to Alzheimer's, and the clusterin is another protein that is related to um, uh, Alzheimer's. So these uh, these proteins are uh, the biomarkers that happens that generates in the body, or uh, it will change the concentration of those uh, uh, proteins in the body uh, because of the, the infection or because of the uh, you know onset of any disease. So by measuring these uh, uh, you know the concentration of these biomarkers in blood or in plasma. Uh, some cases, uh, these biomarkers are, um, uh, you know, they appear in um, uh, saliva. So by detecting these ones, we would be able to uh, detect. But uh, but then again, uh, for multi analyte detection, especially for dementia, Alzheimer's, uh, there are different biomarkers. So we can't, um, uh, you know, just detect one particular biomarker and then we can't say that particular person is infected or that person has developed Alzheimer's. So we need to different. Uh, we need to have a, a panel of biomarkers and the sensor that that would be, you know, the, that is able to detect different types of biomarkers, so that we can just uh, collectively we can uh, analyze that person and then, like you know, we can come up with the uh, diagnostics. Thank you, and uh, I think we have time for one more question. So, what is the difference between uh, the nanomaterials and molecular materials? Uh, which one is highly preferred in biosensing? The nanomaterials or the molecular materials? I mean, uh, one advantage between uh, uh, nanomaterials is like uh, large scale fabrication is uh, a possibility. Uh, it is a possibility for nanomaterials. And uh, there is a loads of um, uh, you know, research going on and uh, uh, new nanomaterials have been in, uh, you know, invented um, every now and then. And then people are uh, keen on exploring their uh, uh, possibilities. And then from bulk to nanomaterial, uh, the characteristics has been like uh, fantastic. Like uh, there is a huge improvement in the electrical uh, characteristics or electronic uh, characteristics in the nanoscale. Uh, whereas the molecular markers, uh, they are offering like a very high, uh, very good sensitivity and selectivity towards that particular uh, disease. But then I would say the, uh, maybe the, uh, you know, the uh, synthesis of those molecular markers might be, uh, you know, challenging in that case. So, but then it depends on like, you know, what we need. So there is uh, always a trade-off so it is up to us, like, you know, to choose which one, uh, uh, you know, fits the particular uh, disease and the requirement of the disease. So exactly. I think uh, we have covered almost all the important questions that have been asked by the participants. So with this, uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Anita on behalf of the organizers. Let me thank Dr. Anita for the informative and excellent presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anita. Now over thank to you, Dr. Dr. Loganath.
thank you anita for your uh, very interesting and informative uh, talk on biosensors i'm sure that this is going to be the future for in lk system because everybody speaks about prevention then cure so yeah. and we look forward for collaboration with you in this direction because we definitely dr kida and thanks for many of our uh, work Thank you. Thank you for coming forward to. Oh, uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my research experience, and uh, I'm definitely keen on uh, establishing collaboration with uh, your research center as well as uh, with VIT in whole. So uh, we would definitely, uh, you know, keep this ball rolling, and uh, we'll explore the possibilities for future collaborations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Dr. Anita. For, uh, for your interesting talk on uh, bio, bio nano sensors. Thank you very much. Uh, and also, I want to thank uh, Dr. Sendhil Kumar, Associate Professor uh, uh, VAD, for chairing this session. I want to thank all the participants for uh, actively participating in many of the sessions. Thank, thank you all. The next session will start at 7 p.m. Please, uh, we are closing this session. Please rejoin in at 7 p.m. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.